Well, hello everybody. It's been a while, but we're back with Clashing Worldviews in the U.S. Supreme Court. We're in a different room. For those of you that are watching, we had a flood in our basement because of a lot of rain, so we're upstairs in a different room, but um, this is going to be great. So we're going to finish up Chapter 6 on Kaiser, and we're going to begin Chapter 7 today, which deals with uh, abortion and abortion case, okay? If you remember the case uh, with Kaiser Aetna, it dealt with water rights. It dealt with um, in, in an instance where a private company is developing a harbor, okay, can they develop that harbor and enjoy their property rights without the federal government coming in and saying, no, because you develop this, now it is like good for everyone, and we're going to take your property, and it's going to be under the control of the federal government. That's, I'm simplifying the case, but that's the issue. So the issue is... Do individuals and private companies enjoy private property rights? Or, if the federal government desires, can your personal individual property rights be given to the government? Now, the Fifth Amendment says that if there is a piece of land that is open to public use, um, that, that, that it, in other words, think, think of, again, I use Joanna's example. Her house is right in a place where the government wants to put a freeway. Can they take her property? Yes, they can for common good, but they have to reimburse you for it. Okay? That's, that's called the taking clause. So, so that's the issue in this case. How far do, does your personal property rights go, and how long is the government's arm to reach in? Okay, so we talked about that. You can review it last time. Um, but I just want to talk about a little bit of the worldview analysis here of why Harry Blackman um, basically sided with the federal government. He felt that the federal government would do a better job with uh, Joanna's house and property than she would, so to speak. Okay, he, he, he felt like the federal government, if... if, uh, if uh, Somebody creates a harbor for pub, for a private use, but suddenly now it could perhaps benefit the rest of the community. The government's hand can start getting longer. Okay, that's what he said. Okay, why did he say that? Okay, first of all, what we have to realize is progressive Protestants embrace a collective view of human rights. Okay, so so they are they're going to be. Okay, remember, their view of God is they emphasize God's imminence over his transcendence. So God is not so much standing outside of all of creation and acting within it as much as God is within creation, God is within society, and God is within the flow of society. We've talked about that before. Remember that a little bit? Okay, so that causes them to see individual property rights as more, again, collective and not individual. Okay, so, so, so they would say that it's everybody's land. Um, they are far more, I'm going to be controversial here, but I'll say it anyway. They are far more supportive of state control of public education. They are far more supportive of, hey, it takes a village to raise a child. Not so much your personal family. Not so much moms and dads. So, so they are much more supportive of public schools than conservative Protestants would be because they tend to view, it, you know, a, a more of an individualistic view of personal property rights and the fact that a mom and a dad will do a better job raising a kid than the government would. But Blackman thought differently, okay? So his view is, again, um, God is imminent within the historical evolution of society. And so, again, because God is in society, there's nothing wrong with giving up private property to the federal government, because that's an act of God in society. In other words, if, if society is changing and the Environmental Protection Agency starts saying, hey, this, 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 this river and this piece of land or whatever needs to be taken from private citizens and given to the public use so the federal government can use this land or whatever, um, their, their view of God says, well, that must be God moving in history, and that reflects the will of God. I know that sounds really odd, but, but again, if you have a chain, your view of God really, really matters, okay? And, and, and the key for all of us is to maintain the tension between God as transcendent, 
God created this world, but he's not a part of this world. But he's also imminent. And then he works within it. Well, how does he work within it? Well, at least two ways, for sure we know, through the Holy Spirit. We see this as early as Genesis 1. What is it, verse 2 or 3? Where it says the Spirit of God hovered over, right? In other words, he was, even as God's creating everything from, from a distance, the Holy Spirit's hovering, right? He's moving. And then the incarnation of Jesus, right? God is working within. And now, what does it say? Christ in you the hope of glory. So, so through the Holy Spirit, Jesus lives within us mm -hmm. every day. So he's imminent every day with us. I sense his presence right now, even as I'm speaking. I really do. I sense him. That's God's imminence. But, but it's both. Okay? If you overemphasize God's transcendence, what do you have? You have something called deism. Is that God winds up the clock, sets it in motion, and doesn't interact with the world. So there's no miracles. There's no resurrection. There's no healings. There's no salvations, right? Because if God just winds it up and, and he's... So so if you overemphasize God's transcendence, that's what you get. You get the God of Benjamin Franklin. You get the God of Thomas Jefferson. Is it, yes, I believe in God, but I don't believe he interacts and does things in, with people today. The, the miracles and all that in the Bible, God doesn't do that anymore. Right? Mm -hmm. What happens if you overemphasize God's imminence? Well, you get this, this concept where God is intermingled within culture. So as culture shifts and changes, and again, have we seen some shifts and changes in America in the last calendar year? Mm -hmm. They would say that's God working. Now, no, as conservative Protestants, we would say God is still working. Mm -hmm. Through COVID, through this crazy election and all of its fraudulence and craziness, through what's going on in Afghanistan right now and poor federal government policy that led us to this place is, God, yes, God is moving, but that's not necessarily God. You, you know what I mean? In other words, God is trying to bring his kingdom come and his will to be done in the midst of all this, but it does. you don't equate homosexuality with this is what God wants. You don't equate the Black Lives Matter political movement with that's God. You don't equate the insanity going on in Afghanistan with God. Now, God can, God can cause all things to work together for good, but the flow of culture, and especially the ethical degradation we're experiencing, that's not God, because God's standards are fixed and permanent. But if you've got a purely imminent view of God, there is nothing to separate what is going on in culture with what God is doing. Okay, and that, you see how we make that distinction? They don't make that distinction. They're both the same thing. So when the government starts to take more and more private property, they're fine with that because they think that government would do a better job because perhaps that's the flow of God. That's the work of God in the world. Remember what we talked about with Hegel, okay, because I've got the note there. German historicism. German, German historicism came from Hegel. The flow of history is the flow of God. Where we say God stands outside of history and acts within it, Hegel and progressive Protestantism says, no, the flow of history is the work of God in the world. Okay, so, and Hegel said the march of the state is the march of God in the world. That's a loose paraphrase. So in other words, whatever the state's doing, that's God. So that's where... Blackman would look at the government takeover of more and more private property. Hey, the march of the state is, he may not have thought Hegel, but that, but that influenced his theology within Methodism. Right? And remember, we already talked about this. A hundred years ago, that, that was percolating through Methodism. And so they thought that way. You see how your view of God affects even your property rights? It's important. Okay? Um, progressive Protestants place, again, the locus or the center of sin on society, not so much the individual. Okay? Not, that they, not that they totally discount sin, but they feel that institutions are more the problem than individuals. If we could just fix the institutions of racism within the government within business, within society, that will make for a better world. If we could just liberate more and more people 
who feel sexually bound by old Christian traditions and customs, and we can progress beyond that. We can liberate people because people are not necessarily, the problem is not individual sin. The problem is society hindering our expressions of what we want to express. Okay, so, so that causes them to, again, see that government intervention is a good thing. But the thing is, when they do this, and it isn't working, they continue to try to still do it. What is, what is behind that? I don't understand that. Don't they realize that if it didn't work the first time, it's not going to work the second time, no matter what they well, do? Okay, what do you mean that what's not working? Give me an example. Well, you, you know, mean. when they say that uh, we can raise your children better than you can. And so they try, and then it doesn't work out, and they come at you in a different way. They'll take them away from you now because you're not raising them up the way that they should go. But or, okay, practice. They'll take them away from you if you don't allow them to transition their gender. Mm -hmm. That is going on in America right now, where suddenly now the state is seen as a better uh, uh, solution for raising kids than a parent. In fact, they say that your parental prohibition of their gender transition is harmful to them. That, that's the world because again and, and so the view is that again governments it takes a village to raise a child so to speak you know and, and remember at the backdrop of again let's just talk progressive Christianity not so much culture which is already wackadoo do okay it is but, but let's just talk about the, okay progressive Christianity they would look at again the problem is not so much that little Susie wants to be a boy, and that's sin, but the problem is outside the parental repression of that desire is oppressive and wrong because sin is outside little Susie, and it's on mom and dad. That, that's the view of progressive Protestantism. Okay? And th that is the dominant view in America today. Because again, if you reject sin, if sin is no longer individual, if we are no longer, uh, what's the word? Uh, um, well, what does Paul say? You know, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. In Romans 3, you know, we're vile, we're this or that. If you reject that, now the problem is not little Susie and her desires. The problem is everyone that wants to keep Susie from enjoying her desires. Okay. And, and that, that's what we're talking about when they place the locus of sin or the center of sin outside of the person. You see how that leads to all kinds of problems? Because now we're basically good, or at least bet you we're better than what we used to be. So how dare you hinder my stuff, what, what I want to do? And you see this in the case on abortion. You see this in the case on homosexuality later on. Is that Blackman was very consistent. He felt that the problem was outside traditional Christian values is the problem. And you're like, wait a minute, aren't you a Christian? So who are you labeling progressive Protestant? Is it a group? Or just a mindset? Is it a group? Well, it's, it's a, I mean, there are progressive Protestants out there. Uh, uh, strands of Episcopalians and um, uh, congregational churches. United Church of Christ, for sure, very much. The Methodist, Methodist, I mean, I just talked to a Methodist pastor yesterday, and they're splitting. He, he, he's, he is basically going to become an independent because what the Methodist church, they, they've, kept, they've been kept from doing this because of COVID. They couldn't get together. But all of the Methodists most likely next year are going to split. You're going to have a, we are pro-homosexual marriage, pro-homosexual is fine with God Methodists, and those that hold to a Orthodox, biblical understanding of human sexuality, and he said, "I'm I'm getting out of all of it. I'm I'm not even I'm not even waiting for the vote. I just I don't want to deal with this. I, we're just going to be in, like an, almost like a non-denominational church. So so those are individuals. So so it's a mindset. It's bad theology, but it is there are people that follow this. So based, bottom line, they're probably not born again. Right? Most likely, or they're not. not. And to me, that's remarkable, okay? Knowing how much of a pagan I was before Jesus, I am not religious enough to be a Christian under progressive Christianity. 
Because unless the grace of God acted within my heart and changed me, I, why would I want to go to church? Why would I want to do it? It's like, good grief. I can go out in the world and have more fun. How about you? I, I, I mean, I'm just not that. To me, it's remarkable. But again, there's, there's, if you would go inside a progressive Christian church and talk to them about a lot of ethical issues, you would see no difference from what they're voicing than what Hollywood says or what, because it's the same. So it's, it's very low, um, uh, what's the word I want to say? There's, there's not much of a challenge <laughs> upon their lifestyle. It's not much so different. It's just a, a society type thing. Um, let's just gather. Yeah, let's yeah, just it, it, it's become a club. Yeah, you're not going to sense the presence of God there. But, yeah. I, I okay. For, for studying for this book, I, I was researching um, uh, the church that William Rehnquist grew up in. Okay, and that church changed in nineteen in the nineteen sixties to a United Church of Christ church, a UCC church. Okay, which is very progressive. And 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 and, and Rehnquist, of course, was gone by then. He was already. Yeah, serving in, in, in federal court, but his family, his mom and dad were like, okay, and they left that church. So like, it's far too, I, that, what is this? This isn't Christianity. Well, I, I was watching a video of the, of the pastor of the church in, this was 20, I don't know, 2012, 2013. It's, it's since gone now off, off of their website. But he went off and basically said, we are going to be a gay affirm we have been a gay affirming church and all that kind of stuff and i want to let you know as your pastor i am gay and i you know and, and it was all it, so, and i listened to him speak for half an hour not one not one not one not one scripture was used in his sermon not one okay that is not unusual within progressive christianity because you know because remember they already have a very low view of the Bible's authority anyway. Because remember, in the 1800s, it was like, science, yes. The Bible and its authority, no. So it, it's already very much diminished. So why, and, and what ground is that homosexual pastor? That's an oxymoron. But anyway, what ground does he have to stand on from scriptures? Now, I've heard all the convoluted arguments from scripture that they use, and they pretty much look at all of the scriptures in the Bible, in Leviticus and in 1 Corinthians and Romans, and they say that, you know, they, 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 they twist those up like a pretzel. But, they don't, but there's, no, there's no basis of, of biblical authority. I don't know if I answered your question. You're saying no, you do. Just, this is not just an you idea. Know, when we talk to people, and we're hearing these things, and it, well, the ones I know do quote the scriptures, and that's the only place of agreement that we can go in order to get their mindset changed. So, right, but if they, guessing, but I do know the congregational and that they do have a whole different structure. Yeah, it's very no, not all, but many. Okay, right. I want to be careful. I paint this right. Not all, but but many of them. Yeah, and the Methodist Church in particular is kind of split. And it's, it's literally going to split this next year. You're going to see it cease to exist in its present form, and it's going to be two different entities. Um, and yeah, so, so it's not just an idea. It's not just theology. There are real flesh and blood people that follow this. Yeah. There are many within evangelical Christianity following yes. this right now. You know, many. And these are those that are what they call deconverting or deconstructing Christianity. I've never heard that term. Anyway, it's just, yeah. So, so sin is, is on society, and that is very much, that goes all the way back to Rousseau. We already talked about Rousseau was a French dude in the 1700s that pretty much, he was like the first hippie. And he pretty much says, man is, he opens one of his books with this, man is born free, but is everywhere in chains. So what he meant by that is man is born free. The assumption is humanity is basically good. We are free, but everywhere we're in change because of social custom, tradition, Christian theology, what mom and dad. In other words, everything outside of us puts us back in chains. That is the logic within progressive Christianity. That is the logic that gave us the Obergefell pro-gay marriage Supreme Court decision. 
You're free inside, but who are we to put you in chains? We're going to allow you to express yourself and to become liberated and free once again to express yourself. That logic goes back two, three hundred years to Rousseau. Again, he was like the first hippie. So if you've got friends that are pro gay or pro this, they don't, again, the book, the, the, the Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self by Carl Truman, that's the book I pushed all summer. It talks all about how we got to where we are today. And he goes long and hard on Rousseau. He's like, you've got to understand this guy because your average non-believer, your average progressive Christian, they think like Rousseau, even though they can't trace their idea back to him. That's this progressive, I'm free, but you're putting me in chains. How dare you, mom and dad, prevent my conversion surgery I've got planned at the age of 14 mm -hmm. to transition from a boy to a girl? Because I'm free inside. And of course, it assumes that there's no sin. There's no internal sin. Mm -hmm. Did that help? No, nothing's got my idea. I'm just trying to help you understand <laughs> why they think I don't that. Ask you <laughs> But, but, okay, let me say this. This is why they look at Christians and Christianity as the bad guy. Mm -hmm. Christianity is actually harmful mm -hmm. for people. That's why there are laws within states that say, as a Christian psychologist, I cannot counsel you to repent of your sin, of your homosexuality, your transgenderism, and come to Christ and, and stop pursuing that lifestyle that the Bible says is wicked. Because that's harmful. Because again, if man is born free and you're trying to put me in chains, that's harmful, Christian. You're trying to put that per that little one or that, that man back in chains. That's the logic. I'm trying, I'm, I've, just, I, I've just ripped the veil. Okay, so now you see the man behind the curtain. That is the man behind the curtain that drives the gay agenda within America. Rejection of sin and you're free inside, and everything externally basically starts putting you back in chains. Or the Bible says, wait a minute, hold on, hold on. If you want to really live, deny yourself. Mm -hmm. Take up your cross and follow me. The world says, express yourself. Get liberated so that you can freely express yourself. The free expression of the self is the way to life. And Jesus says, no, if you want to go that way, you're actually going to, it's the way of death. Let me say it another way. Go back, go to 2 Timothy chapter 3. In the last days, men shall be, what? Lovers of themselves. Okay, it doesn't elaborate what that means. But you, can you see where Paul, writing, got insight into the culture we live in? In other words, this is exactly this expressive individualism. This man is born free, but as everywhere in chains, lovers of themselves. That drives these Supreme Court decisions. That drives these SOGI laws, these sexual orientation, gender identity laws. Mm -hmm. Lovers of self. Mm -hmm. Why is that exactly the opposite of the way to life? Because Jesus said, if you want to save your, if you want to save your life, you're going to have to deny it. Mm -hmm. If you want to lose your life, exalt the self. But the world would say, no, you want to gain life, exalt the self. And it's exactly the opposite. It's over our children. It's well, also a view of what it means to be human. It's also a view of what sin is or is not. Because again, we're dealing with the consequences of a rejection of sin, the consequences of the exaltation of the self. And it's made its way into our laws and our Supreme Court decisions. And it affects our children. Well, I mean, you know, I was brought up Catholic. That at an age they would never leave that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, so, what does the problem say? Right? Train up your child the way you should go. So, right. Have we been training up our children, or have we just let the state and education take over that role already? So it's already yeah. set in place for them to take over. Every Christian school. parent has to wrestle with hey. Who is primarily responsible for the education of my children? I am. Mm -hmm. So, if I'm going to delegate it to the state, that's fine, but what are your parameters? And if suddenly the state doesn't start fulfilling because you're delegating it to that, it'll be just like you having a babysitter. You can babysit my kids, but there are certain rules. You know, 
you're not going to bring a bunch of friends and have party, party when we're gone for the weekend when you're watching my children, right? It's the same principle with delegating to, to the state to educate. You can do that because you're working, you don't have time, you don't have money, you don't have the ability. That's fine, but you're going to have to go back to the state and check them if they're teaching things or whatever. And that's what every parent has to wrestle with. I am a product of a public education. I turned out fine. Hopefully. The twitching <laughs> of my left eye is stopping now, but I'm, I'm better. Right? But, but, but and, and I used to use that logic with Christy with our own kids. And she said, honey, honey, you understand culture more than most, but don't you understand the public schools have radically changed since the 80s when you were in high school? And I had to come to grips with it, my own kids. We've had to wrestle with that. And every parent has to wrestle with that. But I mean, as a Christian, we need to understand the primary person responsible for, for educating my kids is me, is the parent, is not the state. And then you gotta make choices. And homeschooling is becoming much more attractive in the world in which we live, it is. And then the flip side, well, who has time, who has money, who has, yeah, you gotta wrestle with all those dynamics. Is that what your question was about, or, or just thinking through the implications? Oh, yeah, I guess I, I, guess I need to read your book, How We Got Here, because it really bothers me. Yeah. I probably screwed up here. No, well, hey, our, my, both of my kids went through public schools, and I was a substitute teacher at the public schools in which my kids were going to school for 10 years down in Illinois. So I had a, I had a front row seat to what was being taught, you know, and, I, and it was... Decent, it really was. The kids were wicked <laughs> in the community. They were. If you want to see what kids are really like, go on their social media page. Yeah. Don't just look at them. Don't just look at them in church. Don't just look at them at the ball game. Or, oh, look at uh, look at their social media. You'll find out what they are really about, and it's well, it's shocking. I just when I grew up, I went to parochial school, so. With all that, but it was like when I was in my early 20s, I was no longer under my parents, and there was a period of two or three years that I questioned everything. If it had not been for God, I would have gone way over there. Yeah. So there's got to be a time, and I see it in my own children at a certain time. My faith was like weaned, they were weaned from what mom and dad were over them and yeah. they started testing all the limits yeah. and because they had the word of God ingrained in them at a young age they have come back sort of to what God wants them to do so it's like yeah it's every young person has to have that Jacob's wrestling with God thing mm -hmm. you know you got to wrestle with God yourself you, you're going to have to realize do I really believe this stuff or do I not and you got to wrestle with God and all that fun stuff. Yeah, sure. It's what we're talking. This is a discipleship issue. This is a discipleship issue. This is why I would love to have a bunch of twenty and thirty somethings in our church because they need to understand this stuff. Because that's why it's getting off. They don't understand this. They really don't. Mm -hmm. And um, can you do me a favor, Connie? Can you shut both of those doors because the worship team is going to start practicing and it's going to get noisy. <laughs> that's okay. that's one of the reasons why we did this downstairs. Okay. Uh, okay so. Moving along here, so the third aspect of, of, of the progressive Protestant view of property rights is driven by, again, social justice. They're very big on social justice and that what is just and fair, and so they have what's called an egalitarian ethic. What in the world does that mean? Okay, in other words, egalitarian, everything's equal. Okay, Joanna's property is my property, is Ruth's property, is Connie's property, is Debbie's property. That's egalitarian. Okay, so, so they're going to look at property rights, not as an individual, as, but, but this is everybody's. And because social justice says, what are the have-nots that don't have property? Well, the federal government needs to take Joanna's property so that it can be freely redistributed to everyone. So everyone can enjoy that piece of property because property is, again, it's everybody's. Each has an acre. Okay? <laughs> yeah, but but it's, it's that same logic. That, that drives that. Does that make sense? That's an egalitarian ethic. In other words, social justice says if we can just create equality of outcome, 
we can have a better world. It's what drives affirmative action. We talked about this before. But this idea that, hey, a, a minority individual can't get into Harvard. Their test score is far lower than a white applicant. But we're going to prop up in the name of egalitarianism or equality. We're going to prop that person up so they can go into Harvard in the place of somebody who scored high on a test that was a white person because that's fair. Everyone gets their fair share. Okay? That is a big part of the social justice within progressive Protestantism. Well, how can they, if they're doing that with, with the person that doesn't have the score to get up there, how can that individual even maintain itself with the one who has all the knowledge in it? I don't understand, I, that's what I don't understand. How can they? Or let, let's, just, let's just leave that tension there <laughs> and let's let the government Give everybody free college education. Everybody. And we're going to extract your tax dollars to make that possible. So if you take what, what Joanna just said, what about, okay, so everyone can now go to college, but what about the individual that's just not really made for college? They can't do it. Yeah, They're going to they flounder. Can't, can't it do doesn't it. matter. Everyone gets their fair share. That's this egalitarian ethic that drives progressive Protestantism. You know who really got this? When I taught in, in a prison, and I would teach those prisoners, and we talked about, they're like, and they would say, that's just dumb. If everyone got free education, you know there's certain people that they're not gonna try, they're not gonna, and it's just gonna be, and they were just like going, I was like, wow, wow, the felons get it. You know, these guys were, more, I, mean, I was actually telling Chris years ago, I wished I would have a personal jet, and I could fly the distance where I used to talk, it's four and a half hours, I would go back and teach, and I loved, those guys. I loved being, we just, it was great. But they really got this stuff. They were just like, that's dumb. Because, you know, only the people that really want to try are going to be, be successful at this thing. Not the people that, you know, anyway. Mm -hmm. But that, but that's, that's what causes him to say, the federal government does a better job. The Environmental Protection Agency needs to create, you know, extract more pieces of land for everybody and take it away from private businesses and private citizens. I'm just trying to tell you how they thought. Okay? So the government is paying for somebody. So somebody has to pay that college. So the government is paying for that college for somebody who can't learn a darn thing in there. Mm -hmm. just, <laughs> or they could and they don't want to. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I've seen it this summer. Because I taught, I taught three classes this summer online. Mm -hmm. And one, my last class, there was, six, there was nine people in the class. I think I failed four of them. I don't like to fail students. I don't. I really don't. But you, it, the ones that I fail, they earned it because they just they didn't try. They didn't. You know, I, I had a student. That's being recorded. Anyway, just they earned the failure. Okay. If they blow off an entire test and ask me six weeks later if they can retake it, and they get mad at me when I say no, they earned that failure. I had to deal with that this week. So anyway. So one other thing that drove Blackman's um, uh, decision in Aetna was he, he was very much beholden to the environmentalist movement. And so because of all that, that caused him to do that too. Okay? In other words, if you think the environment is more important than people, you're going to begin to side with that. And, and are, are we dealing with that in, in, in America right now with the current Biden administration? Sure we are. You've got people over these agencies, you've got the, the, the individuals that are beholden to the current president, they're environmentalists. So they think, shut down the Keystone Pipeline. We, we don't want to damage the environment to get oil so we can not be energy independent because we were under the previous administration. But the environment is more important than people. Okay? From a biblical perspective, there is a hierarchy in Genesis. Okay, well, God, people, animals, plants, earth. Right? You better keep that in line and it leads to great flourishing. If you put God first, it's going to lead to flourishing. Mm -hmm. If you put people first in, in environmental concerns, it's good. No, that doesn't mean you plunder the earth. It doesn't mean you destroy it. No, but, 
But what we're dealing with is an administration that does not operate from a biblical worldview when it comes to the environment. And, and so, so, so uh, environmental rights trump, pun intended, the rights of people. So that's why we're now beholden to the Middle East. That's why gas has gone from a buck eighty-five a gallon to three ten a gallon. I mean, it really it, re it reflects a worldview shift. It really does. We're going to shut down and, and hamper the coal industry and the oil industry because of it. Now, again, I think you can do. I think we can walk and chew gum at the same time. I think we can extract materials from the earth and preserve it at the same time. I really do. I think we can. But anyway. so okay, this is from. Uh, this is a quote from Richard Lazarus. Richard Lazarus was Blackman's law clerk, worked with him, wrote cases with him. And he talks about worldview here. I think this is important. He doesn't even know it. Says the Blackman papers, these are a bunch of papers that Blackman wrote. You can go online and read all of them. There's hundreds of pages of, of just an interview that he had about his life and his decisions. I use that a lot when I wrote these chapters. The Blackman papers reveal justices often discussing their own views of the policy implications of an environmental ruling, even when those policy preferences should arguably be irrelevant to their disposition of the legal issue before them. You know what he just said? He, he, here's, and, and, and Lazarus is a very pr progressive liberal um, clerk. He's also he's an attorney right now, very liberal. But he's, he, what is he saying? He's saying the policy preferences of those justices should be irrelevant to their decision making. Just because you're pro-environment or anti-environment or pro that, you should decide based on what the law says and not inject your policy preferences. And what he's saying is <laughs> these justices are injecting their policy preferences in their decision making. Should not do that. that that's a pretty candid admission he just said there. Okay? Um, many of those individual policy preferences appear to be a reflection of the justices' own life experiences, both personal and professional. The papers therefore confirm the common sense notion that a justice's own life experiences affect their perception of a case, even if not always their ultimate vote. Justice's life experiences inevitably affect their appreciation of the impacts of alternative rulings in the real world. That too is human nature, and judges, even Supreme Court justices, are human. Again, that's a very candid admission that these, in other words, who is supposed to inject their policy preferences into policy in the federal government? Who do you think? Who's supposed to inject their policy preferences? Is there a place for policy preferences in our constitutional system? The answer is yes. Okay, I'm helping you. So who should do that per the constitution? Should judges do that from the bench to where there is no appeal? Then who's supposed to do it? Does it come from the legislature? There you go. Yeah, the legislature. In other words, that's where there's argument and debate. That's where you can personally call your congressman and say, that's terrible policy, shutting down the Keystone Pipeline. What were you thinking? Now we're beholden to Middle Eastern oil. Okay. In other words, that's where policy preferences come in play, and they're important. Because that's where the framers set it up, that you and I have a voice. Can you call up a Supreme Court justice and tell them you're very frustrated with your decision? No, you, you can't do that. And that's, again, <laughs> liberals, progressives tend to be what they call judicial activists. What, are, what is judicial activism? They're, they're deciding from the bench. They're legislating from the bench. right? They're rejecting their policy preferences from the bench. That should be irrelevant. And so for a progressive to say that is pretty remarkable because Blackman was one of the greatest judicial activists ever. Roe versus Wade is judicial activism. His policy preferences for what abortion is went into that. It should not, he should have kicked it back to the legislatures. Decide for yourselves, for the states. That's how you do it. That's where policy preferences come into play, or should. Does that make sense? Kind of? Is this too much constitutional law for you, Debbie? Okay. <laughs> Bring it on! All right, okay. Um, okay, I already talked about that. Um, and I don't want to go long into um, uh, Rehnquist, because we, we, as conservative Protestants, we kind of already understand that. Okay? What is the foundational understanding of property rights? What would you say from, from a scriptural perspective? How are we supposed to understand individual property rights? 
Does the Bible say that you are to enjoy your individual property? Yes. Where? Where in the Bible? Probably when God delegated it out to people, and each one, each tribe was getting their amount. Their, their okay, money. you got that. Okay, take care of it. So, so there's a personal responsibility for that sphere, the, the garden. And we don't know how long, how and far. Do not move it is, your boundary lines. And okay, do, don't move boundary markers. Okay, there's actually one that's even well. I think it's easier, but. How about the Ten Commandments? Thou shalt not covet. steal. Or co steal. Covet and steal. Both of yeah. those. In other words, the idea of coveting is, wait a minute, that's not your stuff. That's your neighbor's stuff. Well, why are you wanting to have their property? So, yeah, coveting and thou shalt not steal. And, and again, I want to belabor the point because it's in there. But, you know, uh, Rehnquist was really good at memorizing stuff. And so what, what Sharina says, and I tend to agree with her, Given his penchant for memorization, it was not unusual for him. Remember, he won uh, some roller skates for memorizing the Ten Commandments? In other words, that most likely stayed with him, thou shalt not steal. Right? That, that's, so, so we're going to look at that and go, no. The government should defer to individual property rights because thou shalt not steal. And again, who ultimately owns property on the earth? God, right? The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. When you die, are you taking any property with you? No, you are not. So, so while God does recognize individual property rights, in the end, all the pieces of the game go back in the box, right? As, as, uh, as, as a Christian author once said years ago, right? At the end, it, it all goes, you don't take it, okay? Make sense? Yes. Questions? Thoughts? Connie, any thoughts, questions? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Okay, that's all right. Uh, let me. I forgive me here. I got to switch over to the other slide and get it. But you know, but understanding the Bible. In other words, the Bible has far more to say about human life than just your spiritual life. And understanding property rights is 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 really important. You know, and um, yeah. And I tend to agree with um, James Madison, who, again, I read the account of On Property, his essay. He said, the most sacred of all property rights is your right to conscience. And therein, everything else flows from it. I, I, I agree with that. I agree with that. Um, okay, so, so let's, let's talk about this case, Webster, okay? Um, the facts of the case, it's an abortion case. Okay, I'll just read this and we'll talk about it. In 1986, the state of Missouri enacted legislation that placed a number of restrictions on abortions. The statute's preamble indicated that the life of each human being begins at conception. Can you see where that would run afoul of? Um, and the law codified the following restrictions. Public employees and public facilities were not to be used in performing abortions. Unnecessary to save a mother's life. Encouragement and counseling to have abortions was prohibited. Physicians were to perform viability tests upon women in their 20th or more week of pregnancy. Um, and, of course, it was struck down. So, so the issue in the case was, did the Missouri restrictions unconstitutionally infringe upon the right to privacy? Okay, remember Roe versus Wade established this right to privacy. This woman has, you know, my body, my choice. Is there mandating mandate everyone wear masks? But anyway, that's a whole other deal. Okay, so, so, um, so basically... Uh, the court basically struck down um, many of the provisions in the, um, again, I'm not going to get into, in, in the um, Missouri law, but um, they still upheld abortion. Okay, They really thought that Webster, this case, was going to overturn abortion. Okay. It didn't. There's a current case percolating through the Supreme Court right now. I cannot think of the name of it, but I think it's from Louisiana that may it, it's actually going to put right in front of it's right in front of the court up or down on abortion and i think the court's going to take it so it'll be really interesting this next year what they're going to do okay um so um so let, let's let's look at the different views okay what you see in this case is is you really begin to see uh blackman's morality really shine okay a lot of times these these justices will cloak their morality, their moral position on an issue, 
he didn't. He really let it let it shine out, and um, and so um, and a big part of it was he valued a person's autonomy. In other words, the decision of what is right and wrong when it comes to abortion, when it comes to human sexuality, when it comes to all those types of things, a person's auto what is that? What does autonomy mean? Do you, do you know what that means? When we say autonomy, the right of an individual to decide for themselves what they want without any external force making you decide. It's that expressive individualism. It's men shall be lovers of themselves. Okay, that, in other words, autonomy is the government should not regulate abortion. The government should not stop abortion. It should be the right of that individual woman to decide for themselves if they want to terminate the fetus, baby or whether they want to have the baby. Okay, so, so for him, the highest good is your ability to choose for yourselves. In other words, there's nothing higher than that. <laughs> so so where, where are we going from a biblical perspective? Well, you're back in the Garden of Eden, aren't you? Genesis 3, right? Satan saying, you know, did God, in other words, you decide for yourselves good and evil. That's what autonomy is. Again, this is from a Christian. Of course, this is a progressive Christian that is going to disregard what the Bible says. And yet, so, so you're going... You got to see this. So, if you disregard what the Bible says, you're going to go in an entirely different direction, aren't you? So, what an individual decides for themselves is what is right and wrong and good. That's the highest. That's your moral compass. So, what's the problem with that? Is there a problem with that of, of an individual's view of what's right and wrong is your moral compass? What could possibly go wrong? You're taking a life that you shouldn't be taking. <laughs> yeah, but it's not really a, a baby. It's a fetus. It's a baby. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a fetus. No, it's Where a baby. Are you getting, why is it a baby? <laughs> because it's a created being inside you that God has Yeah, you, that idea of created, that's from the Bible. You can't use that. Yeah, it's Science a, is authoritative. Yeah. I mean, you, you see where, yeah. you can see where that thinking comes in. Yeah. Because again, if you, if you reject creation, if you reject the Bible, you're going you're gonna to think that that is the highest good. And that's what we're dealing with in our culture. So many people think my own personal choice, my own personal desires, that's the highest good. And for you to say it is not, you're actually evil. Do not murder. <laughs> well, you know, I'm, I'm thinking of um, also the end of the book of Judges. In those days, there was no king. And everyone did what was right. right. So, so in other words, if you take that logic... And you apply it to culture. Where are we going as a culture? To the paganism of the book of Judges. Aren't we? Violence. All kinds of immorality. All kinds of sexual craziness. I mean, that book, you're like, whoa. I mean, I used to read that. I used to read, read Judges when I was younger. Chris, I was like, this is such a cool book. And now I read it, I'm like, oh, gosh. <laughs> That's really gross. There's some gross stuff in there anyway. So why do we have to pay for their abortions? That's right. Why do they put it on the taxpayers to pay? Yeah, yeah, it doesn't exactly. It make sense. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. We're paying for Planned Parenthood. Yeah. But of course, Planned Parenthood, their, their primary business model is not abortions. No. Yeah, it's counseling they, women and helping. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. Right. yeah. So yeah. Counseling to have an abortion, that's what they're counseling them for. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so, so because he believes in human autonomy, again... That's based on the, the progressive Protestant view that we're not really sinners. Sin is actually external, not so much internal. And so we need to give, again, any barrier to what's called self-actualization needs to be removed. Okay, that's called a progressive or expressive individualism. Okay. So the progressive worldview that undergirded that morality, okay, is, again, the Bible, we already talked about, is, but Bible shouldn't be scripture, anyway is no longer viewed as without error. So the Bible's filled with error, so you can't use that. It's not a baby, it's a fetus, because the Bible has errors. Mm -hmm. I know you're trying to quote Psalm 139 for me, Joanna, that I was in my mouth, but, but again, it's filled with errors. How do you know that that's really true? Mm -hmm. Can you hear the serpent's hiss when oh, I say yes. that? Right? Yes. How do you really know that that's true? Did God really say, right? Is that the same thing? 
You're causing me to see this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so well, I'm trying to show you the viewpoint. I, I mean, you can see the consequences if you if you go in that direction. And I guess for me, you're seeding desire. Ah, okay. Just... I was that way seven years ago when I first started doing this. I've worked through it. <laughs> the twitching stopped in my left eye. But you know, as I'm studying this, because it was so opposite of how I thought. It was, and I was just like getting, oh my gosh, this is so. That's what I was doing. So yes, I've worked through it on the other side. I know. <laughs> so there is no fall, and there is no original sin. Because again, if you reject the authority of the Bible, and so there's no historic Adam and Eve, so you reject that. And so that leads to you thinking humanity is basically good. Jesus' human nature and his teaching were elevated over his divine nature and substitutionary atonement. And in other words, they, they're, they're, they're looking at Jesus' ethical teachings, but that he atoned for our sin. Personal conversion is no longer required. I know somebody was saying, hey, are these people even born again? Most likely, the majority of them, no, they're not. And we talked about this. By the 1930s, within Methodist churches, the altar call and conversion was basically non-existent. There were some, a few remnant churches but for the most part, the idea of coming up to an altar or, or giving your life to Jesus, that was never happened. Okay? Um, the doctrine of last things, okay, you know, the end times and that, uh, there's no heaven, there's no hell. And so if there is no heaven or no hell, or it's de-emphasized, why would you need to get saved? I mean, you can see where if, if you begin to, to get rid of some of these, I mean, these are all core doctrines, right? The Bible is the word of God. Um, no sin, um, no substitutionary atonement, no need for conversion, no help. Those are pretty significant. In other words, you can pull certain things out of the Bible and the edifice will still hold. You pull these out. You just, you just took the heart of the gospel. <laughs> it's gone. Okay, so, so that informs his thinking. Um, he emphasizes reason over revelation. Okay, so, so the nature of truth is science. Not what God's word says. Okay, and, and this is something we have to wrestle with. Okay, Debbie, as you're talking to people that are not believers, you know, you have to realize what the Bible says about life, about creation, about right and wrong, about property rights. That's not just my own subjective opinion that I hold with my fellow Christians at our Christian club on Sunday mornings at 10 in the morning. That is true for everyone for all time. And then if you actually embrace this, it will lead to the greatest degree of human flourishing. Does that make sense? In other words, this is what's called a cognitivist view of the Bible. In other words, it is cognitively true for the public square. For everybody. It's not just a Christian thing. It's, in other words, if you actually understand individual property rights are really, really important, okay, and, and a government that really honors that, you're going to have a better government and people are going to live better lives. Okay, in other words, it's true publicly. It's not just true privately. We've got to be able to communicate that to people because you go, again, when I go to college and teach, keep that to yourself, man. It's all science. It's all science. All that. That's this idea of reason over revelation. Progressive Christians emphasize that. But hasn't science in a lot of places proved that the word God is true? Give me some examples. How, science, how can you? Okay, let me, okay, let me counter it with this. Okay. The scientific method... Okay, let me say it this way. The sci science, as defined by scientific naturalism, cannot do what you just said. Why? Because scientific naturalism says the only thing that's really real is that which is in the physical world. And the Bible and its truth claims claim both natural truth, natural world truth, and also supernatural. So if science has already rejected that, scientific naturalism, how could they prove it? But the archaeology, the digs, are proving the Bible. Yeah, you, you, really yeah. Th there are certain digs yeah, that they're actually, they're, it's not just, we don't have to fear archaeology. We have to fear somebody discovering something. You know, we don't have to fear anything of science. We don't, because the Bible is true. We know it's true. 
and science tends to confirm it over time. The people that tend to disconfirm it and, and reject it are scientific naturalists that reject God and supernatural and all of that anyway. So, 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 so the answer, Ruth helped a lot. The answer, you know, certain things in science can keep corroborating what the Bible says about, was there really a guy by the name of Josiah? Was there really a king named Hezekiah? They start digging up this stuff. Wow, the inscription says Hezekiah. And it says this particular time frame or, or something like that. Okay, yeah. So, so science will start corroborating that. But then you yourself have to believe. Right? You, you yourself have to go, okay, as a good scientist based on the evidence, is there enough evidence here to cause me to shift my belief system? I mean, is that true for anybody? Not just the scientists, for any person. Didn't you come to that point? Didn't any of us come to that point of giving our life to Jesus where we realize, you know what, based on the evidence, whether it's a friend's testimony or you're like, you know what, I need to, we all have to go through that and the, and the evidence. The problem with these scientific naturalists, they are so resistant to it, you have to have a lot of evidence. I mean, but again, it's a human heart thing and they're going to make that decision. Connie, question? So when they come at you and say, I believe in science, what am I supposed to do with that? Well, I, I know two things you can do. What do you mean by that? Well, and how did you come to that conclusion? I would ask those two questions. In other words, what, why do you think science is authoritative for everything? My knitting groups. Oh my gosh, I, I walk out of there with a scream. <laughs> why? Well, because... They're, all they do is talk about, I believe in science, science says that you have to do this, and I believe in science, that's how they're dealing with their issue, and I'm just sitting there going, finally I just said, well, where's God in this? It's like, you know what to do with it. Yeah. And then I'm the one that walks out flustered, because I don't know how to respond to okay, all Okay, so, this. okay, when you're saying... I'm trying to rephrase what you said. You said they they use science for the solution for something, or is that yes? What and, solution and for all, what? Solution for what? Just shots. The whole everywhere, every week, uh, I deal with this thing over and, and, and over and over. And there, it's well, science has proven it, and it's like no, that's not true. Yeah. Well, okay. A couple of things. I don't the, want to go there. <laughs> <laughs> Time will not permit me to go to this. Deeply, but this will probably be the last thing we talk about. Science is not bad. No. Science is a tool. Okay. It, Forgive it, this it, crass analogy, but I use the crass analogy. Okay. Take a knife. The knife can be used by a, a murderer to do some really bad things, mm -hmm. and the knife can be used by a surgeon to save somebody's life. Right. The problem is not with the knife. The problem is with the human heart that's using it. That's using it. Okay. Right. So, so let's be really clear. There's nothing wrong with science. I it's a tool to discover knowledge. Mm -hmm. The issue with science is if you understand how it works, the scientific method, it's never settled. In other words, there's always a new discovery that tells us. So, whereas the Bible is settled, mm -hmm. it's true for all time. If homosexuality was wrong 3,000 years ago, when Leviticus talks about it in Leviticus 18, it's still, in other words, these are timeless principles that don't change. Okay, these ethical principles. But science is continually discovering it. And so the person that puts all of his faith in science concerning masks, concerning vaccines, okay, as Christians, we need to listen to that. We need to do our homework. We need to research and make decisions. But the, anybody who's honest at all, who has lived in America in the last 18 months, has got to admit, has science changed its mind many times on these issues? Mm -hmm. So, so, why are you so sold on it? Could there perhaps be some room for error in the decision makings of someone like a Dr. Fauci and all of these myriad other individuals that are claiming this? In other words, there is no settled anything. So why on earth would you stand on something that is that unsettled and rest? Because look what it's doing to your emotions. Are you full of anxiety and fear? Or are you full of peace and rest? My guess is the former, not the latter. 
So perhaps you need to have something a little more foundational to base your life upon. While listening to science and not being stupid. Does that make sense? In other words, these are things I would say to them. Because the, what people don't understand in science, well, the science is settled. When somebody says that, they are revealing their ignorance of yes. science. Yes. Science is ne science by definition is never capital N E V E. -E it is never settled. settled. Yeah. It is always trying to discover more of. In other words, science is like little islands of knowledge in a sea of ignorance. And so, while while this island gets a little bigger, the sea is far bigger than that island will ever be. And so, it'll never. Who knows everything? God does. God allows us to discover things, but ultimately we will never build a big enough island of knowledge to overcome the sea of ignorance, this side of eternity. God, and so we've got, you've got to tell people that and, and gently, graciously instruct them. Science, by definition, is never settled. So you are literally putting your feet on quicksand and expecting stability when, it, by definition, it will never come. The earth used to be flat. Now it's round. Right? In other words, if, you are, if you're a flat earther today, wow, you are so old school. It's always changing. That, that, those are things I would say to them. The other thing I would say to them too, Connie, is we are living in a culture of fear. People are fearful. I've got a... Right, and that's not... I would also approach them on that. Yeah, because it's like, I mean, the one group at the senior center, I had enough information where I can give what I wanted to do, but then I got this other group, and it's like, Oh, I mean, you walk out of there like this. Yeah, but but, but you've got to be light and salt in the midst right. of a tasteless <laughs> and and dark world. That that's just all part of it. In other words, thank God you're there. I mean, thank it's, God you're there, Connie. Like everywhere I go, that's all anybody wants to yeah, talk about. Yeah, it, it's it's and fear, it's and I don't fear. Yeah. And you don't make decisions yeah. I don't, yeah. fear. Yeah. yeah, and you know it's going to the doctor. They're putting yeah. that because they're putting that pressure on Gary. And Gary's finally, he just says, it's my religious beliefs. <laughs> yeah. But it's, yeah. It, it, you know, because it's like, stop pushing something on us that right. we don't feel safe with. Yeah. Right. So it's, yeah. it's not just this, it, it, yeah. you know, it's like, but, but, can't we just stop? But Connie, you need this? to, you need to, for, for people that have ears to hear, not everyone has ears to no, hear, but problem. people that have ears to hear, tell them, science by definition is never settled. It's constantly, again, Use your this analogy always islands of knowledge. Okay, our island of knowledge of COVID and how to deal with it is it larger today than it was in March 2020? Yeah. Yes, it is, but is it incomplete? Yeah, because it's never gonna. So, yeah, yeah. Oh, but we have to close for today because I have to leave. And um, interesting way to leave this, but hopefully, this was helpful to you. And we will see you all next week. Take care. Amen.